Welcome to the 10th year and the 18th event in the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture Series. I want to thank all of you for coming to tonight's lecture by Han Dong Ping. This lecture series was created in honor and in memory of my husband, Will Miller, a social justice activist and professor of philosophy who taught at UVM for 35 years. As our logo for the lecture series says, Will will always be remembered as a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Our mission, which will help to construct, brings speakers to the UVM campus and the Burlington community to provide a continuing program of radical analysis of social, ecological, and political concerns. We have brought to the Burlington community speakers who have talked with us about national anti-war efforts, globalization and immigration, the war on terror, global warming, the financial crisis of capitalism, Afghanistan, the roots of the world's ecological crisis, the struggle to transform Haiti, indigenous people versus the fight for climate justice, how our economy is undermining the environmental revolution, the US as a global empire, protest movements and social change over time, global resource wars, Native American rights and the struggle against the tar sands, and Ferguson and our history of injustice. We've also brought the play Marx and Soho by Howard Zinn and performed by Brian Jones. And we brought in Hari Kondabolu, who brought us a funny night of outrage and politics. Will would have appreciated each of our presenters and would have enjoyed meeting them, talking to them, and debating with them. He was an amazing social justice activist who offered reasoned and insightful analyses into the origins and workings of capitalism and imperialism, giving us both a call to struggle and a vision of a more just society. He helped us to understand topics that felt too big to understand, just as each of our lectures have done. We were incredibly lucky to have him in our lives for as long as we did. Will's voice was powerful, he had an unwavering commitment to the struggle against war and for social justice. Will would be so incredibly proud of UVM faculty members, staff, and students who are continuing to speak out in the name of social justice, both on and off campus. I'd like to recognize and thank the board of the lecture series for their work to determine topics for the lectures and for the help in finding speakers who are current on the issues that Will would want us to be discussing. Our current members are Helen Scott, Fred Magdoff, Mike Cassidy, Ron Jacobs, Ann Peterman, and myself. We could not do this work without the generous support of people like yourselves who make donations to the lecture series. We thank you for helping to assist us in keeping Will's legacy alive by making a contribution tonight in the plastic bins which will be quietly passed around during the lecture and will be at the exit doors. We also have t-shirts for sale at a table by the door, which helps support our work. A number of other UVM departments and local organizations have sponsored this event. We're grateful to UVM's departments of history, economics, Asian languages and literature, and geography. United Academics is also a generous sponsor of each of the lectures. The departments of sociology, anthropology, and political science endorsed this event. Off-campus endorsers include the Burlington Chapter of International Socialist Organization, Global Justice Ecology Project, and the Will Miller Green Mountain Veterans for Peace Chapter. A few years ago, I began the tradition of reading a favorite poem of Will's at lecture series events. This poem is written by Howard Zinn, another extraordinary social justice activist and university professor who was also greatly missed. It offers us inspiration in trying times which never seem to end on Getting Along in Difficult Times by Howard Zinn. You ask how I managed to stay involved and remain seemingly happy and adjusted to this awful world where the efforts of caring people pale in comparison to those who have power? It's easy. First, don't let those who have power intimidate you. No matter how much power they have, they cannot prevent you from living your life, speaking your mind, thinking independently, having relationships with the people you like. Read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Harassed, even imprisoned by authority, she insisted on living her life, speaking out however she felt. Second, 
Find companions who have your values, your commitments, but who also have a sense of humor. That combination is a necessity. Third, notice how precise is my advice that I can confidently number it the way scientists number things. Understand that the, major, that the major media will not tell you of all the acts of resistance taking place every day, the strikes, the protests, the individual acts of courage in the face of authority. Look, and you will certainly find it, for evidence of these unreported acts. And for the little you find, extrapolate from that and assume there must be a thousand times as much as what you've found. Fourth, Note that throughout history, people have felt powerless before authority, but that at certain times, these powerless people, by organizing, acting, risking, persisting, have created enough power to change the world around them, even if only a little or briefly. Fifth, remember, those who have power and who seem invulnerable are in fact quite vulnerable. Their power depends on the obedience of others. And when those others begin withholding that obedience, begin defying authority, that power at the top turns out to be quite fragile. Generals become powerless when their soldiers refuse to fight. Industrialists become powerless when their workers leave their jobs or occupy their factories. Sixth, when we forget the fragility of power imposed from above, we become astounded when it crumbles in the face of rebellion. We have had many such surprises in our time, both in the United States and in other countries. Seventh, don't look for a moment of triumph. See it as an ongoing struggle with victories and defeats, but consciousness of people growing over the long run. So you need patience, persistence, and you need to understand that even when you don't win, there is fun and fulfillment in the fact that you have been involved with other good people in something worthwhile. Okay, seven pieces of profound advice should be enough. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Fred Magdoff, UVM uh, Emeritus Professor, and he will introduce Professor Han Dungping. Ping reminded me that it was 23 years ago that we met. And we met uh, here at UVM uh, because he was a graduate student in the history department. And I got a phone call at the time. Nowadays, probably it would be a, a text message or something like that from his major professor, his advisor, um, uh, Peter Siebold, uh in the history department. And Peter asked uh, whether I would like to be on Hans defense committee for his uh, master's thesis. And he said, I think you'll find it interesting. And uh, so uh, that's, how, that's how we met. And I, as far as I know, it's the last time we saw each other <clears throat> was at his, um, at his presentation and his defense um, of, of his thesis. Uh, out of the thesis came uh, what I consider to be an absolutely remarkable book, which is called the Unknown Cultural Revolution, Life and Change in a Chinese Village. And this is the, the cover. There are copies available uh, for people to purchase if you'd like. Uh, they're $10 a piece if you'd like. I'm sure uh, Dong Ping Han would be happy to, uh, to uh... Can you speak louder? Excuse me? Louder. louder. That's always my problem. OK, thank you very much. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, this book uh, is available. It's, uh, it gives a very different picture of what was happening in China than what almost all of us have gotten through what we have read in the media. If we've read novels, we've read uh, so-called history books. Um, most of those have been written from the point of view of intellectuals or urban dwellers. Uh, and some of them uh, did suffer during the, the, the Cultural Revolution. It was a time of, of a lot of chaos. Uh, uh, occurring, and a lot of unfortunate events. On the other hand, people in the rural areas uh, have a very different picture of what happened during that time. 
And I heard a, a very similar story to the one that, uh, that Han Dang Pin uh, writes about in this book uh, from uh, another person from Shanxi province who had been a village leader during the Cultural Revolution and became a wheat breeder, which is how I ran into him as a scientist. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it was viewed as a very uh, important and very progressive era of time. So uh, anyway, that's uh, just wanted to give you some background. Uh, after uh, getting his master's here, uh, Han Dangping went to uh, Brandeis University and got his PhD, taught at Illinois, and then has been at Warren Wilson College for 16 years, or thereabouts. Uh, he returns to China every summer. He takes students with him. He does interviews uh, with uh, Chinese uh, farmers, mainly. So his interest is, is mainly in the, the rural areas of China uh, today. And he was back this summer also uh, with students as before. So uh, the presentation tonight on the economic and political crisis in China is really uh, what, uh, what we asked him to do, is to try to give us a somewhat of an historical perspective because it's very hard to understand all the various problems that are going on in China now without having some background as to what it was like in the post-revolutionary period after, uh, the, uh, after the revolution in the 19, late 1940s. So uh, the title is from the, Great from the Great Leap Forward to the Cultural Revolution and to the Present. So the economic and political crisis in China, Han Dengping. I don't need this. I use this one. Yet. Yeah. I don't know if I turned it off or not. No, still on. Sorry about that. Yeah, this fine. This fine. Oh, it just went back on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let me just take it away. So there won't be any feedback. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Fred. And uh, it's a great honor for me to come back. As Fred said, I graduated 23 years ago. Uh, the last time I saw you, not just at a defense, actually, your father came to visit you. I went to your Fletcher house and to see your father. That's the last time we met. And uh, before I start, I want to tell you, even though I teach in the United States, down my heart, I'm still a Chinese farmer. And just now, one student asked me, are you an American citizen? Yes, officially. I am an American citizen, but in my heart, I'm still a Chinese farmer. What I'm going to speak tonight is not uh, common among Chinese. I speak my opinion, my bias, on most Chinese farmers' bias, okay? So I'm not representing anybody in China. I represent myself, and I think my ideas are most come from Chinese farmers. For the last 30 years, even though I live and teach in this country, I went back every summer to interview Chinese farmers. So my opinion in the book and my talk tonight mostly represent some of the Chinese farmers. Okay. And uh, in the eyes of the Chinese government, in the eyes of many, many Western capitalists, the Chinese China had been very, very successful for the last 30 years for developing its economy. On the way here this morning, I heard the public radio announced that Chinese China surpassed the United States in the number of billionaires. China now has 594 billionaires, more than the United States, right? Many people consider this a great accomplishment in China. But as far as I'm concerned, or Chinese farmer concerned, this is really, really a big joke. The socialist China, the, the revolution, thousands, millions of Chinese martyrs sacrificed their lives to create a more equal society, end up in more billionaires than the United States, the capitalist country. Okay. And uh, tonight, I want to talk about uh, the Chinese, the, the something Chinese government don't talk about. And uh, most American media don't talk about. 
but I want to talk about the, the crisis in China. And uh, of course, the crisis of many, many food, right? And uh, for me, the most important one is legitimate crisis. But let's go over the, the, the major uh, crisis today, right? The economy is slowing down. And you all heard the Chinese stock market crashed, right, recently. Many, many Chinese working class were lured into the stock market and put their lifelong savings into the stock market. And it was crushed. Many, many people heard very badly. And uh, number two, we have a huge excess capacity, industry and uh, real, real property. The Chinese have can produce 100 million steel today. They have a capacity to produce 100 million steel, 100 million tons. The US only produce 80 tons. So the Chinese produce more than 10 times than the United States. So they have a huge excessive capacity. They can produce a lot, but they, can, they don't have the use for it. And the housing problem in China is huge. And Fred knew my, my fight with my local government. And uh, in the last two years, my local government in my hometown decided to dismantle all the village houses in the town. More than 10,000 houses were dismantled in a matter of two weeks. And I put a very huge fight for two years. I threatened local government. They thought, I was fighting only for myself. So they invited me to go back to talk to them last summer. Not, not last, the summer before last summer. And uh, they said, you should convince your parents, your, your sister or brother, to give up the house. Right? I told them, it's not my mom. It's not my sister who was against this dismantling of, of rural, rural house, household. It's me. And I oppose it because it's not benefiting local population. And I fought for two years. And uh, I won the fight, <laughs> right? I told them, if I lost, if I lose, I lose my house. If I win, I could get them into jail, right? And they were a little bit intimidated by my, my fight. So eventually they give me, okay? There are a lot of buildings, a lot of houses in China built. The Chinese government estimated they build enough house for three billion people. So they have a huge excessive capacity. There are many, many ghost towns in China. I will tell my friends in China, a house is valuable only when somebody lives in it. Without somebody living in it, it's nothing. But there are a lot of houses in China empty, and nobody lives in it. Okay, and uh, there are a lot of debts in Chinese local government. The Chinese national government has some debts, but the most successful debt is in the local government. Many, many local governments in China want to look good in their GDP performance. So they borrow a lot of money to develop. My hometown for you is a good example. Actually, they don't know whether they will, be, they will be make money or not building these houses. But they want to build it. They thought they can make money. So they borrowed a lot. They are deeply in debt. And um, there's one problem. Another problem is in the last few years, in the last couple of decades, the Chinese turned education into an industry. They want to make money out of education. So they expand college education. The college campus has been expanding, and the enrollment has been expanding, but they don't have enough jobs, opportunity for the college graduates. Many, many college graduates barely make enough money to compare with the working migrant farmers. So they make one or two thousand Chinese yuan. It's about three or four four hundred dollars a month. So a lot, of, a lot of college students are not happy in China. Uh, in 2013, I got uh, a Lucy Foundation grant to go to 
Yunnan province to do some research. When I was there, a few college students came to my hotel room and asked me what I can help them to fight this situation in China. And they asked my advice. I told them, you don't need any advice from me. When you cannot find jobs when you graduate, when you cannot afford to buy a house, when you cannot afford to marry or have children, you will know what to do. Many, many Chinese students today are organizing, are demonstrating protest, are studying Marxism to look for solutions for their problems. I think that's a crisis for Chinese government. Okay? There's also a lack of workers in the urban areas. For the, three, for the last three decades, there's about 200 to 300 million Chinese farmers left the countryside, migrated to the urban areas, looking for jobs. The number is decreasing today. And partly because there are not enough jobs in the urban area. And also because many, many workers were injured in working in these modern industry places. And the people who are 35, 35 years old already have a lot of health problems. They can no longer continue to work in the urban sectors. So the number is decreasing, migrating to the urban areas. Pollution. Pollution is one of the most important problems in China today. And uh, air pollution, you heard the smog in Beijing. I think that's the, the least serious part. The most worst part is the water and the soil pollution. More than half of Chinese rivers dried up. And the most Chinese rivers in northern China became sewage. And northern China has a serious water shortage now. And this caused cause partly because urbanization. The urban people use much, much water. And when I was growing up, I remember most Chinese farmers didn't have showers. They shower only when it rains. And uh, they seldom wash their clothes. They wash their clothes only during the summer. They don't wash their clothes during the winter seasons. Okay? Now the urban population use the water much, much more. Okay? And more and more people live in the urban area now. When I was growing up, there were only about 20% of people living in the urban area. Today, the Chinese government claim is about half the people living in the urban area. And the Chinese government still continue to push for urbanization. And that's really, really worsening the pollution problems in China. Okay? And uh, some food has been, become contaminated because the polluted soil and the water or alteration. I think the, 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 the Chinese government uh, statistics indicate about 10% of Chinese soil is seriously uh, polluted by heavy metal. And uh, that part also contributes to Chinese food insecurity issues. And uh, the Chinese government uh, statistics showed the Chinese imported about 80 million tons of grain last year. 80 million tons. That's a lot of grain. When the cartridge was over in the 1970s, China was already self-sufficient in food supplies. And today, after the three decades, China is no longer can provide its own food. And uh, the use of water in North China, not faster than replenishment, leading to large-scale water transfer from South. Actually, the, this, this is not only the, 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 the problem, it's actually it costs more than the, the use of water increase. It's also because of the change of farming styles. In the old days, the Chinese farmers always hoeing their land during the summertime seasons. They are hoeing not only to weed their crops, they also hoeing to preserve moisture in the soil. But today's Chinese farmer introduced herbicide from the U.S., from the West. They no longer hold on their land. According to some statistics, about three volumes, of three, the volume of three yellow rivers water 
evaporated because of lack of hoing in China. That's one of the reasons why the, 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 the water shortage in northern China. Okay. Uh, at the political social side, we have a huge political corruption problem in China. And uh, 15 years ago, when I was doing research in Chinese countryside, the Chinese farmer used to tell me, if we kill every other officials, maybe too many corrupt officials get away. If we kill every official, maybe one or two would be wrong. I talked with many, many Chinese local officials, actually. They themselves would admit, if by Chairman Mao's standard, they would have been shot several times. If you ask Chinese farmers today, they will tell you every Chinese official is corrupt. Even Chinese officials themselves, if you talk to them at a banquet, they always consider themselves corrupt. They will always see they have to be corrupt in order to survive in the official circles. It's become a social calamity. In order for you to get promoted, you have to pay your superiors with money. So it's a culture of corruption now in China. You all heard Chinese President Xi Jinping has been right, fighting corruptions. I don't think he will be able to fight it. He can only fight a few target officials. He cannot solve the corruption problem. The capitalist system generates new corruptions on a daily basis. Okay? And uh, there's also wide, because it's official corruption, there is a widespread discontent. And over land and home confiscations is a huge problem. The Chinese local government, they want to make profit. They want higher GDP. So they dismantle farmers' house, and they want to build a new higher rising buildings. They never discuss the matter with farmers. They just decide to do it. And force the farmer to leave their houses if they refuse, they will hire criminal guns to do the job for them. And there's huge popular discontent over this. Okay? And uh, I met some Chinese uh, farmers. And uh, two summers ago, I was walking in the early morning. A Chinese farmer walked up to me and said, could you bring a message to Obama? <laughs> I was so shocked, actually. And uh, they are waiting for Americans to liberate them. Can you imagine? Some farmers see that, <laughs> right? And uh, I think uh, the former US ambassador to China, and uh, Hansen, he said, uh, the, American, the Chinese young people is on American side. There is some truth to that. There are a lot of people who are so angry with Chinese official, officials, they actually sometimes say things like that. They wanted outside help to overthrow their government. Some people see that. OK? And uh, we have a huge demonstrations. According to Chinese government statistics, they have more than 300 demonstrations on a day, every, every day, involving less than 100 people. They have 200 demonstrations on a daily basis, involve more than 100 people. This is a very, very serious issue in China. The Chinese government published a huge, they call the official reference book. It's about this thick every day. So the Chinese the Xinhua News Agency and some important reporters can all contribute to that candidately. And I read it there once in a while. One time I read it. Uh, there's about one, one case in, in Guangdong. And uh, one day, the police stopped a car without a license, uh, license, license plate. And when they checked the drivers, they found out the driver didn't have a driver license. Right? But the driver from the car yelled, the police are harassing people. They just yelled, the police are harassing people. 2,000 people come up. 
and be the two police officers into coma for three days. The government noticed the, 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 the tension between the people and the police is very high, so the police should be careful. That's the Chinese government comment on the, on the, at the end of the, the story. It's a very, very common for Chinese people to rise up against the local government in China today. Okay? And uh, the Chinese government claimed they spend more money on maintaining social stability than the military budget. That's how Chinese government today worried about popular rebellion and demonstrations. The Chinese military budget, anyone know how much? How much Chinese government spent on the military budget? Anybody know how much U.S. spent on, on our budget, military budget? <laughs> how, how much U.S. spent on the U.S. military budget? About 600 billion, right? And the Chinese government spent about 140 billion dollars last year, okay? So they spend more on maintaining social stability than the military budget. Uh, the crisis, uh, the current crisis is like that. But I want to put this in the, in the, in the historic perspective. Uh, in the West, you hear a lot of people talk about the, the greedy forward, right? And uh, a lot of talk about how many people starve to death. And I will tell you, the reason I decided to write my, 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 my book on the car revolution, because when I first came to the United States, I was shocked by American writing about the Chinese car revolution and the Great Forward. I was born in 1955. When the Great Forward took place, I was five years old. I still remembered my hometown was flooded. Three summers consecutively. And uh, I, grew, I still remember I grew up in, during the car revolution years. That's why I wrote the book about the car revolution. I talked about the Great Forward a lot in this kind of way, well, right? So natural disaster during the cultural years, during the Great Forward years, is real. It can actually be a 100 year unprecedented natural disaster, three years on a row. The many Mexico study cultural today try to dismiss that factor. They don't think natural disaster was, was, was a reason for the grain shortage. It is. If you were a farmer, if we knew how important weather is, it's very hard to matter how much the weather played in the harvest. Only farmers knew. The intellectual in the urban area never knew that. There were one Chinese scholar argued the, rain, the volume of rain during that three years was the same as, as before, but they don't know what natural disaster means. Natural disaster doesn't mean there's less rain. But there is the same amount of rain, but in the wrong time, or in a concentrated area, that's what natural, natural disaster is about. It's not a, in, over the year, less rain. The volume of rain may be the same over the year, but if they're in the wrong time, wrong place, that's what natural disaster was about. Okay? And uh, apart from natural disaster, the Chinese government, particularly local government, did make mistakes. They overinvest in industry and, uh, and agricultural infrastructures. The Chinese government built 80,000 reservoirs in 1960, more than the total in Chinese history. Okay? So the overbuilding really, really uh, caused problems. Because we detract, they, 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 they distract a lot of people from normal farming work. And I remember in my hometown for three years, we built three huge reservoirs. And uh, millions of workers, or farmers, went to build these reservoirs. So the farm work was neglected. That's one of the reasons we have grain shortage, right? We did have a serious grain shortage throughout China. A lot of people said there were 14 million people were starved to death. I would argue nobody knew 
how many people starved to death. The truth of the matter is nobody knew. I remember in 1993, I gave a talk at uh, Hunter College. And the topic of my speech was the accomplishment of Chinese greedy forward. I was very, very young, very, very experienced at the time, so I gave that talk. Before my speech, there was a guy in the front row. The room was bigger than this. The, the room was packed. And uh, the guy said, young man, he said, ask me first, are you going to speak? I said, yes, I'm going to speak. He said, young man, face it. 14 million people starved to death. You have the gospel come here to talk about the accomplishment of really forward. Right? He said that to me. I said, yes, let's face it. Tell me, how did you find out 14 million starved to death? He introduced himself as Hugh, Hugh Dean. He was the, the, the president of the U.S.-China Friendship Association at the time. He said, we sent our best demographers to Gansu, Qinghai province in 1985 to find out how many starved. I said, that's how you find out how many people starved to death? 25 years after the incident, right? Did you make sure the local officials were there when Grady Forward took place, right? I said, let me tell you how I found out how many people starved to death. I went to Henan, I went to Anhui, I went to Shandong, where the famine is supposed to be the worst. I lived in the village for 30 days each summer. I talked with every old farmer in the village. I asked them how many people starved during the Great Forward. Some people tell me 100. This is in the village of 2,000 people. Some people said 50. Some said, you see, 20. All numbers. That's no problem. They asked them to tell me the names of these people and how old were they when they died. In the end, I found out only one person died who was 37 years old. All the rest died after they were 60. The Chinese life expectancy in 1960 was less than 60 years. My grandfather, on my father's side, and mother's side, both died in 1960 at the age of 60 years old. Were they starved to death? Yes, some people say they were starved to death. But they actually died of old age. The grain shortage contributed to their death because they were weakened by grain shortage, but they were not starved to death. Starved to death, a person is not easy. You have to have no food for seven days. But during the greedy forward, the reason I challenge those people who said they are starvation in China is because we had a public dining hall at the time. The public dining hall didn't provide adequate food, but there were three meals every day. If you have three meals a day, you will not starve for a long time. Okay? I would argue, because socialism, because of the existing public dining halls, fewer people starved during the Great Forward. Without socialism, without the Chinese government's help, more people would have starved to death during the Great Forward. That's very, very true. Actually, my advisor and I got MacArthur, no, Guggenheim grant to study Great Forward family in China. When we went to Henan village, northern Henan villages, when we tell the farmers we are coming here to study famine, they thought we were talking about the famine in 1943. They never thought the greedy forward can consider a famine. In 1943, the natural disaster was much less severe, but five million people perished without any government help. But in 1960, in my hometown, was one of the worst places as well, Great Forward Famine. We were able to get food from Yunnan province. We were able to get help from Shanghai, from Qingdao. We get a lot of help from other parts of China because our problems.
Okay? I would argue because at the time the Chinese government had enjoyed political legitimacy, enjoyed the popular support, the Chinese government was able to deal with the challenges, the crisis during the Great Forward very, very comfortably. There were no rebellion. I was, you, you already discussed with the American professor, scholar, talking about this. Is, you tell me 40 billion, 40 million people stop death. Why farmer didn't rise up to work through the government? The Chinese nation is a nation of rebellion. We have hundreds of rebellion throughout the history. Right? One of my friends said, because farmer didn't have weapons. If you want rebellion, you want to rebel, you never need weapons. The Chinese have old saying, pick up a stick and rebel. Right? You don't need, you don't need guns to rebel. But most American scholars who teach about China, they didn't know one fact. Throughout Chinese history, the elites never allow farmers to have weapons. But Mao was the exception. Mao allowed farmers to have weapons. During the Great Forward, while farmers working in the field, their rifles were attacked right there. When I was growing up, we had rifles in the village. I was trained to use the rifles. It's Deng Xiaoping, after he came back to power in 1982, he collected all the weapons from farmers. Okay? Some people said, oh, farmers were so starved. They couldn't, they were not, they didn't have energy to rebel. I asked them, if they don't have energy to rebel, why do they have energy to build reservoirs? Right? They build so many reservoirs, 80,000 of them. I think it's the Western and the Chinese scholars who were unhappy with socialism, who were unhappy with Mao, tried to discredit Mao to meet up these figures. 14 million people starved. You all hear people see during Mao's time, right? 14 million people were killed. But he also criticized Mao for allowing Chinese population to double when he was alive. The Chinese population during Mao's time doubled. How can you blame Mao for two things at the same time? Starve 14 million people starve to death, and at the same time, allowing population to double. Right? But I think really forward, as I said before, lay the foundation for China's industrialization. And uh, last year, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, 60th year of Chinese founding on People's Republic of China, uh, 65 years. Uh, a journal, um, an Indian journal group asked me to write an article for, for, to talk about why China was able to do so well compared with India. And I argue, one of the reasons China was able to do much better than India during the first 30 years of China is because the Chinese have a socialist system. And the Chinese had a land reform. So more people uh, enjoyed free education, medical care, and uh, had equal share of land. And also during the Great Forward, we worked so hard. The common people in China during most time was empowered to believe they are working for themselves, not for somebody else. So they worked very hard, and they laid the foundation for the Chinese to start doing the Great Forward. Also, we all know the Great, great Revolution and uh, took place in the 1970s. Most countries in the third world country, like India, like Philippines, got their Great Revolution from the West. But the Chinese Great Revolution was mostly homemade, and the Chinese Great Forward laid the foundation for the Chinese Great Revolution and uh, took place in the 1970s. Okay. 
and the corporation year as a as a crisis. Many many people, and uh, including Chinese government, think the car pollution was a huge crisis for China, and some people label it as a national holocaust for China. And uh, at the beginning of the car pollution, Mao suspended police, court, and the prosecutors for two and a half years. Can anybody imagine any country in the world? Dare to suspend police or court or persecutors, right? But the more did. I made, a, I made a presentation this summer in China, and uh, I did a comparative study about uh, the Chinese way of managing society and the Western way, US way, and argued the more police you have, the more crime you have. And uh, many, many Americans at the meeting said, God, I couldn't, I couldn't believe you see something like that. When I see a police on the street, I always feel safer, <laughs> feel secure. I said, you didn't know if there's a police. There is, there is no police. You feel safer, you mean, <laughs> right? And, uh, but more did suspend this place. But I want to tell you, at the beginning of the cultural working years, except some isolated cases of violence by high official children, most Chinese regions are some of the most secure and peaceful time in China history. In my hometown, people say, we don't need to lock up the door at night. And if you lose something on the street, somebody will pick up and return to you. Society was never that harmonious when the police were suspended, okay? And uh, we have some factional uh, fighting uh, during the cultural years, but they're mostly isolated cases. And uh, that's where we're rare in the countryside. And uh, the seeming chaos, I would argue, empowered the Chinese working class. And uh, the police were no longer carrying out orders of the officials. So all the people were empowered to do the thing they can do, like writing big character posters. They don't need to worry about official harassment. They don't need to worry about the police who will come, don't come to the door when they do these kind of things. And. Uh, in my book, I talked about that. There is a large expansion of education in the countryside during the Cultural Revolution years. And uh, before the Cultural Revolution, the teachers in China always argue education must have a standard. And education must be formal. But during the Cultural Revolution years, the Chinese farmers were empowered to think what is best for themselves. As a result, they build many, many more primary schools, middle schools, and high schools. In my book, I talked about that. And uh, by the end of the Cultural Revolution, every village in my hometown had one primary school. Before the Cultural Revolution, we only had seven middle schools. By 1976, we had 249 middle schools. Every four village shared one middle school. Before the Cultural Revolution, we only had one high school. By 1976, in 10 years, we had 89 high schools. Everybody, farmers' children, were able to go to these high schools free of charge. But the Chinese government leaders the Chinese scholars are always talking about education disaster during the conference years. But the truth of the matter is, education greatly expanded during their time period. And uh, we also have a huge expansion of medical care. Before the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese rural area don't have, didn't have hospitals, and the farmer didn't have access to medicine. And at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, more ordered 
the Chinese Ministry of uh, Healthcare to move the focus of healthcare to the countryside. Why? 80% of Chinese people live in the countryside. So with most direction, with the Chinese doctor help and hard work, by 1976, every Chinese village has a clinic staffed with barefoot doctors. Anyone know a barefoot doctor? A high school graduate from the same village sent to a hospital to study for six months and returned to the village to provide rudimentary care for the farmers. Every village had five or six by 1976. I used to have a debate with my uh, professor at Brandeis. And he, one time he said, no, Dong Ping, I agree with you everything you see about education. I disagree with you about barefoot doctors. Doctors had to be the best trained. But so how about attitude of doctors? What if a best trained doctor don't care about you? What if a best trained doctor only care about your money? These barefoot doctors are not well, well trained. But they have something the best trained doctor cannot compare to. They were from the same village. They know their patient. They know their family very well, right? They are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They sincerely care about your well-being. They will do everything they can to help you recover. If they don't know enough, they can always ask a better trained doctor to get help. There's one reason why Chinese life expectancy during most time almost doubled. From 35 years in 1952 to 69 years in 1976, less than 30 years, life expectancy doubled. China started the same year with India, also 35 years in 1952. But by 1976, China was ahead of India by 19 years. That's how I would argue socialism made a huge difference for the well-being of Chinese people, OK? And uh, another part very important, what we call the rationalization of management. I was a manager before I went to a college for five years. I graduated from high school. I returned to my village and managed the village factory for five years. I want to tell you how the Chinese managed their factory at the time. The workers and the management collaborate. The management get paid the same as the workers. And the, the management personnel had to work with the workers. And all the rules were rewritten in the prospective workers. Right? In the old days, workers were not allowed to be late for work. But during the cultural years, a worker can argue, if my wife is sick, why can't I be late for work? If my children were sick, why couldn't I miss work for a day? It's very, very different. It's very, very empowering for the workers. That's one of the reasons why China made huge progress in many, many areas because of the empowerment of workers. And recently, a Chinese doctor got the, the, the Nobel Prize for medicine, right? And the Chinese people began to remind it the breakthroughs we achieved during the current years. That's just one example. There are many, many others. When the private ownership of skill and technology was taken away, People are empowered to work hard, to do things for public good, not for self-grandizement. Okay? And we developed a homemade grain revolution during the cultural years. We made tractors. 
my factory built two trucks for my, my own village. And we did many, many other things for our own village. And uh, we used tractors for the first time. We used many, many other machineries in the fields for the first time. And our grain production increased in my village five times during that time period. And uh, officials were asked to work with farmers. And ordinary people were allowed to write big character posters to criticize officials. And this all took place during the conflict years. And uh, so on the whole, I think the Chinese people was very, very supportive of Chinese government policy at the time. And uh, Chinese government enjoyed political legitimacy during the Cold Revolution, during the Great Forward years. We talked about the love of And uh, the Chinese government in 1975 announced the China, for the first time in history, never owned any debt. Eternal, external or internal, we don't have any debt. And China had many technological breakthroughs. And uh, we, we built satellites. We were the first to artificially synthesize insulin for diabetics. Diabetics, and uh, China built a very, very different democratic political system, asking officials to work with the common people. And many, many ordinary people entered the government. And the Qing Gui, an ordinary farmer, became deputy prime minister in charge of agriculture. Many, many real workers, farmers, were part of the government. And uh, these uh, workers, farmers, no longer just represent work farmers. They were farmers themselves. And uh, with all people's ownership and the collective ownership, China was able to develop and take care of the environment at the same time. I think when we think about the, the, the environmental degradation in the world, I think it's mostly because uh, the, the self-interest of capitalists. They put profit ahead of the environment. The Chinese environment degradation in the last uh, 30 years are mostly caused by private enterprises. Because they don't care about the environment. They want to make a profit first. And uh, during the corporate years, because we all own everything together, we took care of the environment. I went to North Korea this summer, and uh, I saw what's going on in North Korea. I was very, very reminded what China was like in the 1970s. They were able to take care of their environment very much, much better than we do here. And uh, because they don't have these private enterprises, they don't have a capitalist class who are driving only for profit. I think in order to solve our environmental problems, we have to take out private capitalists. We have to let everybody own the means of production. And uh, compared with other third world countries, uh, particularly India and China, was doing much, much better, and politically, economically, socially, and environmentally. We didn't have a homeless population during that time. We solved the drug abuse problem, and we solved the crime problems. We have very little crime, and uh, Chinese society was very, very harmonious at, at the time. And uh, a lot of problems we have today, we don't have at that time. And uh, I think, Fred, I should stop here, right? 40 minutes, more than 40 minutes. And uh, I will in the team question now. How about that? Thank you. Yeah.
about, you didn't mention anything about um, the, uh, what I heard, the yeah. forced movement of intellectuals uh, from the cities into the countryside. Okay. Uh, let me tell you, are you done? Yes. Okay. Uh, the intellectual, force, forceful movement of the intellectual to the countryside, right? They were either the kids about that. But it's not official policy. The official policy is farmers, workers are working very hard to support these intellectuals. It would be, it would be a proper, it's appropriate for these intellectuals, right, who are eating to come to help during the busy times, right? If you are close to a, to a, to a, country, a suburb, during the busy times, the farmer need help, you come to help them for one week or two weeks. I think that's very, very good policy. The Chinese intellectuals <coughs> have a tendency, have an inclination to look down upon farmers, right? They think they are above the farmers. Ask them to work with the farmers. It's very, very crucial and important for intellectuals to learn how farmers live, how they work, how they can relate to farmers. I think that that great deal good for Chinese society, for both intellectuals and for the Chinese farmers. On the farmer side, they feel empowered. They feel they are actually the same as, as the intellectuals. They are working together for the same goal, right? For the intellectuals to get out of their hourly tower, to have a few days of uh, physical labor is also beneficial for them, right? During the cultural years, many, many Chinese professors greatly appreciate the opportunity. But afterward, after they all die, the Chinese government will not allow them to tell the truth <coughs> because they want to condemn the cultural world. But I don't think it's the it's Chinese government policy to forcefully force them to move to the countryside. That's not the policy. Either in the cases, it's a different story. But the policy is integrate working class with intellectuals. But the program continues? The, huh? program, the program continues? No. Our recovery is continuing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I think that's a very, very big mistake. There's some of the problems in China today is caused by the separation of working class and the intellectuals. It's not a few years, right away. Yeah. It's a, a few weeks later, right? Uh, let me tell you this. This is actually very, very complicated. Uh, Mao and Mao's uh, followers are very, very different sometimes. Mao wanted Chinese people to criticize the officials, to help the Chinese Communist Party to, to correct their mistakes, right? But way many, many people began to write criticism against Chinese government. Many, many people inside the party, like Dr. Xiaoping himself, feel threatened. Many, many Chinese cultural officials were, were not educated. They were farmers. They joined the revolution in the 40s, 30s, fighting for the Communist Party. And when the revolution succeeded, they became officials. When the intellectual criticized them, challenged their position, they feel threatened. They want to fight back. So, more of the time was really, really forced by his colleagues to fight back. But I would also argue there are some intellectuals way overboard in their criticism. For example, the Imam, the, the Communist Party, gave up their power to the more educated. Right? The more educated people have more. Uh, I see it. more right, more authority, more skill to govern the country. That's why some of the community said, you want that? Give me the 20 million people death, the 20, 20 million lives. We sacrificed 20 million people to gain national power. Now you want that back? You wanted that from us? You need to return the lives to us. So the fight is very, very I would argue this in, cannot just blame more or blame the Communist Party. I think the intellectual time went too far. 
and uh, forced Mo's hand and the Communist Party hand to fight it back. Yeah, I, I wanted to begin my comments and question with the beginning of your talk, because I think we would agree that right now China needs a socialist revolution. If you look at all the characteristics of the society that you laid out in the beginning, class exploitation, horrible crisis of overproduction, that's the consequence of a three decade boom, massive yes. expansion of the Chinese economy, but with all the characteristic problems of a capitalist society, environmental degradation, all of it. Yep. So the question is, how do we win socialism in China? And that's where the historical debate becomes very significant, where I disagree with you, because I think the definition of socialism, if it means anything, is workers' democracy, workers' ownership and democratic decision-making over the means of production, which is the essence of the whole Marxist tradition. And I think that by that definition, China under Mao was never socialist. And I'm thinking of, the, and I get this not just from Western experts, from the Chinese Trotskyist tradition. There's a new book that my publisher, Haymarket Books, is publishing called Profits Unarmed, about the Chinese Trotskyist tradition. People like um, Wang, Wang Fenxi, who's a very important Trotskyist in China. And then a whole sequence of Western and non-Western intellectuals that have laid out an analysis of what the Chinese revolution actually was, which from my vantage point was a great nationalist revolution, but it wasn't a workers' revolution. And it wasn't really a peasants' revolution either. It was a declassed intellectual movement that led a declassed peasant army that, that seized state power and then faced the problem of how you develop a very underdeveloped economy that had been strangled by imperialism. And there was a, a bureaucratic strategy of developing the society, which I think would be best called bureaucratic state capitalism, in which there was a debate in the bureaucracy, which explains both the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution about how best to develop the national economy. One wing was Mao, who always wanted to rush the pace of national economic development to catch up with the West, that it was driven by competition with the West, the hope for military power and the acquisition of a nuclear bomb to compete with Western imperialism. He wanted to rush the pace, which underlay the Great Leap Forward. So it wasn't in the interest of workers, it was about competition with the West. And the other wing of the bureaucracy said that was a failure. So we can have a debate about how many people died in the Great Leap Forward or its, its um, success in, in whatever in the countryside. But for the Chinese bureaucracy, the Deng Xiaoping wing of it, they looked at this as a disaster because it didn't develop the power of the economy. And so they isolated Mao after that. And that's what the Cultural Revolution was really all about, was Mao trying to inflame students and workers to give him a position to go back into the uh, position of leadership of the bureaucratic planning uh, of, the, of the society. And it got out of his hands. Because he said, let 100,000 flowers bloom, all the great posters, students radicalized, and then more frightening for the bureaucracy, which included Mao, was when workers started striking. They said, okay, we're for socialism, workers' power. Then workers started striking, and then Mao called the army and suppressed that. And then cut a deal with Nixon and imperialism. Yeah, and so yeah. now, now we have a new strategy, which the bureaucracy came up with, of state-led development, but now oriented on the international market, which has worked, but now it's coming back to haunt the bureaucracy. So I think we need a rebirth of genuine socialism, not only in China, but in the United States, that puts workers' democracy at the center of the project. Do you have a question? I would, we had debates too. Uh, I have begun to think, I, mean, I disagree with you on that. Mm -hmm. I think China was socialist at the time. Uh, you talk about the industry, right? In the Penn side, we collect you own the means of production, right? We ask the officials to work with us. So there are no distinction between workers and the farmers. Everybody was paid by how many hours you work in the field. Right? And the harvest was distributed according to 70% on the basis of uh, how many people in your family. And 30% based on how, many, how much you worked. Uh, I don't think you can jump into social or communism in, in, in one day or one night, one year. It's a gradual process. And you think about it, China could become a socialist or communist in one, one year or very quickly. I don't think that's, that, 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 that's, that's possible, uh, looking from a historical perspective. China had 5,000 years history. We have a long time of feudalism. The, the means of production can be, can be forcefully 
nationalized, right? It's can you do it? But the culture, there's five thousand years, right? Uh, residue. You need to deal with that slowly, gradually. I think cultural revolution was toward that aim, and uh, empowered working class. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, you can you can criticize more for many many things, but uh, I think Mao was a communist. And uh, he did a lot of things to help not only China, but African independence movement. And we then people to fight for, for their independence. So um, more many mistakes, but I still think he's a great communist leader. And uh, he not only for, fight for Chinese people, he also fight for the, the working class worldwide. He was involved in American, African Americans fight for civil rights. I think he, he made a great contribution to that. You cannot see it just for national, national, nationalist revolution. I think more fundamentally speaking in the end, he's a communist, he's an internationalist. When I was a college student in the 1970s, I was very depressed with what I'd read from Bill Hinton and Andrew Snow and others whose books I still recommend about the changes in China after the 49 revolution and then the Cultural Revolution, trying to break down the divisions that you've talked about between the city and the countryside, yeah. the peasants and the intellectuals, et cetera. Uh, that sort of thing inspired me. It was part of the reason I went to work in a factory after I graduated or got out of college and uh, went to Detroit to organize uh, workers there. Yeah. But it was very depressing, as you might imagine, that you know, I also was a member of the U.S. China People's Friendship Association, yeah. to send to delegations of workers and students and others to China to see some of these things. But uh, you know, after Mao died in 1976, uh, with amazing rapidity, uh, uh, shocking really, uh, you know, capitalism began to be restored again. Uh, yeah. How did this happen? I know this is a big question and worth of, you know a long lecture, uh, but what is your Capsule explanation uh, for why uh, capitalism, after all of this uh, uh, stuff happened, uh, raising people's consciousness awareness of capitalist rotors and their and how they were looking and getting ready to take power, and how were they able to take power again so so quickly? Yeah, this is, of course I, I was involved in this debate about this too, and you cannot blame one individual, and uh, but I would argue. Mao's mistake, the biggest mistake Mao made, he didn't trust uh, the so-called Gao of Four at the time. He was not willing to give the power to them, right? And uh, actually, the one person who was able to remove the Gao of Four was Wang Dongxing, Mao's bodyguard. The the yes, but uh, Zhang Tuinqiao and Mao's wife asked Mao to get rid of him. Mao refused. Mao said, I'm used to him. So he refused to remove him. But after Mao died, that was the one person who was, uh, played the key uh, role to arrest Mao's wife and uh, the Gang of Four. And of course, the, 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 the Gang of Four, there are thousands, millions of followers will also end up in prison. I did, a, did a research about this. Actually, after uh, Gang of Four was arrested, the same month, about 800,000 most followers in Henan province was arrested. So they have a very, very sweeping uh, uh, purge of most followers. More thought, I think more overestimated the, 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 the right away forces in China. If he put the power in, most, in, his, in the Gang of Four, then things might be different. Of course, it's very hard to to do hypothetical history, right? And you cannot blame just one individual. There must be a social, social base, like the high official children. They are very, very solidly supporting Deng Xiaoping at the time. And a follow-up question is, yeah. Of the, the, I'm forgetting his name, but oh, the, uh, yeah, 
How much was that a genuine uh, neo Maoist uh, kind of movement, and how much was that just opportunism on the part of a leader who wanted to? Uh, to I will tell you this. I don't think uh, Bo Xilai is an opportunist. And uh, Bo Xilai, the most Chinese official knew, I think at least uh, 85 or 90 percent Chinese working class are moist. Many people think, oh, there's not many moist in the world. That's not true. The majority of Chinese farmers' works are moist. And uh, Bo Xilai realized that. Bo Xilai knew if he go back to most part, he will have a lot of support from Chinese working class. So he's not a simply uh, opportunist. Boy, Chilai's family suffered a lot. His father was removed by a mob during the country year, country years. His mom committed suicide. And he was in prison for the, by the police at the beginning of the country. For him to tear around to support a mob is not easy. Right? Is the Chinese reality educated him? Actually, I think most people in China believe he is a real moist. And the fight's not over yet. He's not, he's only in prison. He's not dead. There are still a lot of people supporting him in China. Actually, when he was arrested, I paid have advertisement in New York Times. No, not New York Times, World Journal, a Chinese paper. And one front, uh, second, second, uh, uh, second page, whole page, I said the Chinese people are not convinced by the trial. The first page was he was in Kanakov. The second page was my advertisement. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people in China, I, I met a lot of people, still think that the fight is not over yet. Yeah. So Bo Xilai has a lot of support among the Chinese working class farmers and, and urban uh, former state-owned uh, employee. Any other questions? Yes, this summer. I think the whole world is misinformed by North Korea. Before I went to North Korea this summer, there are Chinese media talking about it. There is huge drought in North Korea. Right? And uh, it's a 100 year drought. But when I go there, I find it's their crops were doing much better than Chinese rice field. Their crops were very, very green, and there's plenty of water. Their crops were doing very well. And the food I eat in North Korea was much, much more tasty than the Chinese food. Why? They don't use much chemicals, they don't have chemicals. Because they were so isolated, blockaded by the United States, they were mostly used a traditional method to raise their animals. And I, I was there for four days, four nights. And we traveled three hours this direction, three hours the other direction. So when we stopped for bathroom on the highway, I was very, very impressed by the, the, the way they raised their animals. You hear a pig walking, the, 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 there's a bell on their, their neck. You hear the, the, the pig walking in the, in the woods, right? And you don't see many people. But their crops, the meat I eat there, they don't have much meat. But the, 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 the little they have is very, very delicious. Reminded me of my childhood in a village when they, we had a pig. And uh, they don't have a homeless population. Uh, the people were very, very sincerely supporting their leaders, just like China was during the cultural years. And uh, I wrote an article afterwards. I said, you see, more American youth, more Chinese, should go to North Korea to see what's going on there. They have a clean air, clean water, and uh, the people look so very happy. And I was, I was telling you in my article, I said, when, as soon as I entered the airplane, I was impressed by the, the smile of the flying attendant's face. You don't find in any other place the sincere, naive smile on their face. And uh, that's what the impression I get about North Korea. Um, I don't know what you mean by freedom of, of movement, right? No, I, I went on tour. I went on tour. Uh, 
There are some Americans who actually travel by themselves. I saw them. And I choose to, to, to I only have four days because my time was very limited. And uh, so I choose to be on the tour. No, they cannot tell what I can see. They took it to me to the places, right? But I can see what I want to see. Now, that's true everywhere. Yeah, that's true everywhere. No, I, I just based on my three, four days experience. I'm not telling you I saw everything. You cannot sell everything about this country, right? Yeah. I don't think that's, that argument, that challenge is, is, is a valid one. Yeah, I don't think that's a valid one. You don't see everything. Nobody can see everything. Yeah. You can argue this way in this country. All the media you read is sanctioned by the government. <laughs> right? Yeah, every country doing the same thing. And uh, in different ways. In different ways. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> Yeah, well, during the Great Forward, yeah. there's a number of reservoirs we built. It's a mostly dam, a dam, dam or river, yes. Oh, it's not small. Last summer, last summer, I was invited by a professor and the vice president of Zhongshan University to give a talk. And after my talk, he took me to see a reservoir in Guangdong province, right? It's called the Xinfengjiang Reservoir. I heard about it. I never went there to see, but I went there to see. You know how big that reservoir was? They have 140 billion cubic meters. Uh, some of the by villagers, some built by national, national effort. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, actually, the 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 Xinfengjiang Reservoir today can provide 14 cubic meters for each Chinese. It's tremendously important for Guangdong and Hong Kong. They rely on that reservoir for clean, fresh water. Yeah. 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 You had cost. Uh, They were constantly compensated. compensated. They were compensated. So it's the same as here. No difference. Yeah, yes. But still, and uh, some of the farmers didn't want to move. It's a forcefully compensated. So you don't want to move, but I want you to move. If you don't move, I'll send some criminals to make life miserable for you. So you have, you have to move. So we have eminent domain here. Yes, yes. Same thing. Yeah, the same thing. I mean, uh, the Chinese corruption. Is no different from American corruption. Com American society is very corrupt too. Right? Any country with such a big gap between the rich and the poor is a corrupt society. Only in America we don't call it corruption. In China we call it, call it corruption because the Chinese people are used to most time. Officials live the same life standard as the common people. Today, they are, their life standard was, was uplift, uplifted, and the common people were angry. They called it corruption. It's the same thing. They were not any more corrupt than American officials. <laughs> yeah. My recollection is that it's, not, uh, it's one thing when uh, your house is taken and you're given compensation and you can maybe buy an apartment that's built. But also there was a lot of land taken. Yes. Farmers were That's right. Them. So their, their actual yeah. their ability to make a living yes. was taken away from them yeah. with very little compensation. Yes. So I mean, that, that I think is what probably generated yes. most of the demonstration. Yes. Was the land, not so much the buildings. That's right. Their houses. Yeah. But why weren't they compensated for the land? The land is, uh, is uh, land owned by state. According to the Chinese constitution, land owned by the state. The farmers only had the right to use it. So they took the, they paid the farmers very little money. The Chinese have three million villages, okay, three million villages. 
we lost about one million, one third of them during the last three, three, three decades. So most farmers lost their land. Was seized by local government, and they sell to the developers to build. So the house, house, house is only small uh, fraction of the land seizure. Fred was right. The farming land was taken away by the local government and sell to the developers. That part is not well compensated. Compensated. That's what the most corruption was, 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 was taking place, actually. Um, how does the current social stratification line up in China compared to the past? Do you have, I, you mentioned, you know, during the Great Leap, there wasn't necessarily 14 million people starving, but there were some people starving. Is it the case that in China there is a low class right now that might be in that demographic that is starving? Um, Does that exist in China right now, or, or has... That would be very isolated cases. The Chinese uh, farmers have a small piece of land. Every farmer has a, uh, has a share of land. Maybe very small, about six an acre, one six an acre. So they can grow their own food on that piece of land. So land, food security is not a big issue. Most poor people, not a quality, most people, poor, poor people in China, they didn't have money to send their children to school. They didn't have uh, money to pay for their medical care. And that's kind of see, the, the, the problem. Uh, in North Korea during your time, yeah. do, you, do you find um, a social stratification that mirrors um, the kind of quote unquote like time and era that they're in? And by that I mean, do you think that there are people who are starting there for sure? Uh, when I was in North Korea, I was, because I, when I applied for a visa to go there, they asked me where I'm from. I said, I have a US passport. They thought I was American, so they gave me a, a English interpreter. So there's a huge interpreter following me. I talked with her a lot. Actually, their pay is very, very similar. Everybody paid about 400 Chinese yuan. So it's very little money, actually. But they told me they have a, each building, very tall buildings. Each building has a building uh, leader. That leader gave each household uh, coupons for meat, for rice, for everything you need to survive. Each month you get these coupons from the, the government and you buy on the first floor all your necessities for the month. Yeah. And uh, the neighbor told me how much uh, cooking oil they get about a five pound of cooking oil, how much tofu, how, some, how much pork, how much meat, uh, fish. I think they have very, very enough adequate food. So when I asked them, I said, the outside world talk about you have a famine here, they laughed. They laughed. They said, you can tell we are not starved. You can tell we are very, very healthy. So some of the Chinese, actually, I was traveling with a lot of Chinese too. And uh, the Chinese people asked them, why don't you learn from Chinese reform? And they said, they answered, I think, very, very well. They said, you know, what's happening in China, what's happening in Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, we knew very well. We don't want to change what we have for what you have in China. Yes, materially, we might be better off, but we don't want to lose our spirit. So I think North Korean people knew what's going on, what's, what's the outside world. Uh, talk about them. Uh, they, were, they were pretty informed about uh, what Chinese, Chinese government look at them and what the Chinese government's uh, opinion about them. So they are not ignorant about that. And I, I hadn't really uh, fully remembered what it was about. What, but what it was about was what happened before the communists took control of the whole country. It was in 1947, the events he writes about in Fan Shen. And I think, to me, and I'd be interested in your reflections on this, Tom uh, Payne, the, the main story is about a village 
in which a work a party had been sent to the village to examine what had happened after the revolution. Had people been treated fairly? And uh, and uh, one of the issues had to be really a corruption of relatively minor officials and what we would consider to be very minor corruption. You know, during the redistribution that took place in this village of about a thousand people, uh, did uh, so and so get a sweater? that he shouldn't have gotten. So we're not talking about huge amounts of corruption. But still, to me, one of the things uh, it, it uh, I guess, surprised me is that it seemed to me that it was part of almost a continuing theme for the whole time of the revolutionary period, yeah. where you had quickly increased the number of people in the Communist Party. You had brought in all sorts of elements yes. into the party uh, as part of a national unity yep. effort, if you will. Yep. And you had within it, uh, it was very difficult for people to actually get control over the party. Yep. And, uh, and uh, that started almost immediately, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it, it seemed to have started in 1927. So uh, to me, that's, that seemed to be a continuing issue within China that you, you have a situation where the, this party that was supposed to serve the people really was composed of many elements. That's right. Relatively easily were yeah. corrupted. Yeah. If you, uh, Brett, back to your, to your, to your uh, uh, comment, if you all, before we die, every year there is a political movement. Right? And uh, after we die, people said, uh, precisely more said, he liked to punish people. He right, like to make people's life miserable. If you all was really, really concerned how to prevent it, prevent official corruption to develop into a very, very bad degree. So people, official, being educated by the empowered common people to pick on them all the time. Every year there's a political moment. Empower asking workers, farmers, to criticize their leaders. That's how more prevented official corruption. If without this political movement, the official tendency to, 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 corrupt, to be corrupt is there all the time. Because they think they deserve more. All the officials think they deserve more than the common people. They deserve more privileges, right? They fought for the revolution. They sacrificed for the revolution. So in return, they deserve more. But Mao was on the other side, trying to empower the common people to, to prevent officials to pre, uh, from you see, taking more than they should. That's, that's what, what happened, that's the story in China in the last uh, 60 years, right? The first 30 years, there's a constant popular pressure on the officials, right, to do the right thing. But after Mao died, the Chinese government abandoned that uh, approach. Mo, uh, Dong Xiaoping said, we will never have a new moment, political movement. And the officials should never uh, listen to the order of masses. So that's what happened. The corruption is actually developed very, very quickly, right away, after Dong Xiaoping came back to power. And the officials' children and the officials themselves become corrupt almost overnight. I think that's a Chinese characteristic. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, part of the Chinese culture throughout history. And the, the, the revolutionaries become corrupt themselves. <laughs> Can you just say a few words about the difference uh, in the Soviet Union? What happened there compared to what happened in Africa and China? Why did the Soviet Union restore capitalism in the Soviet Union? Uh, there are people, the Chinese President Xi Jinping said one word, one sentence recently. He said he was very, very uh, uh, upset. There was no one man stand out when the Soviet Union collapsed, right? When the Soviet system collapsed, no one single man stand out to prevent that from happening. And the Chinese, uh, many, many Chinese people like myself, believe 
The reason why China didn't follow the, 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 the Russian model is because the Chinese Cultural Revolution empowered people like me. Every time the Chinese government have to change the policy, right? With the guru on the, on, the, on the right, there are a lot of intellectual reaction among the younger generations. For example, a few years ago, the Chinese government put out a, a Confucius statue on the Tiananmen Square. One night, it suddenly appeared on the, on the right corner of Tiananmen Square, a Confucius statue. But the next day, there was a huge internet response, criticizing Chinese government movement. So the Chinese government said, we didn't plan to place there. We are just moving a Confucius statue that's just temporary there. So they moved away right away. So the, the cultural revolution trained, right? A lot of Chinese young people at the time. Uh, today you see in their 50s, 60s, they are more critical of the Chinese policies than the Russians. More empowered, a lot of masses in China. And there are still many, many people believing in most uh, teachings in China today. That's why what happened in China is very different from what happened in, in former Soviet Union. Yeah, I think Stalin's policy is he rely on the cadres. He rely, rely on experts. More on the, on the other side, rely on the working class. He don't trust intellectuals. He, he didn't trust the, the, the engineers. He believed the, the, the creativity of the masses. He always see that you know, throughout his life. And whenever there's a problem in China, he will call on the people to solve their problem. That's what happened in Cuba. It's still to do. Yes, yeah. I think Cuba, Cuba, towards the end of Castro, he also, I think, changed his attitude towards uh, most, uh, most, uh, the, the two of them, uh, Cuba was very angry with Jamal, with China, for a time. I think later on, he also changed that, a little bit of that, too. Yeah, Cuba in the, in, the, in, the, in the early 60s were very upset with China because they, they were more leaning towards the former Soviet Union. And that's why China and, uh, and uh, Cuba, uh, the, the, the relationship was not that, that, that uh, cozy for a long time. Yeah. We better okay. finish at this point. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs>